Hello, everyone, and welcome to our community live stream around the topic of bioelectricity. Um, this week, we are going to simply have a community discussion. So uh, if you are watching us and you are on the Discord server, uh, feel free to hop on there and drop a message to get a link to this uh, Zoom call. And on, uh, on the SEMF updates front, as, as you know, we're using this community live streams to give you all some updates on what is going on uh, behind the scenes and what to look forward to and, and what's coming. Um, we have been quite busy with organization towards the summer school. So last uh, community live stream, we already updated that the summer school 2024 is confirmed. We are going to be doing it. Um, now we got further confirmation that it will take place in Valencia like last year. So, oh, hello there, Alana. And we uh, are excited to be able to share that uh, this is indeed taking place. Um, so we don't have any further announcements to make on that front at the moment, but do look forward to uh, more information in the coming weeks because we will be updating and announcing uh, all the details. Um, on a uh, more internal note, we uh, have now uh, some uh, candidates for uh, so some plans for for uh, funding and fundraising. Uh, that's that's our main effort behind the scenes at the moment. And uh, another um, sort of SEMF uh, development is that we will be in Amsterdam. Most of us uh, will be there in Amsterdam. Alana, myself, uh, other associates, and other friends of SEMF in general. Uh, we will be running uh, a workshop like we uh, similar to what we did a couple of weeks ago here in Madrid but instead centered around the notion of the information continuum, as we call it, which is this general uh, notion of uh, how information is encoded in different media and how one can uh, transmit uh, and, and, and store information in different forms. So uh, if you are in the Amsterdam area or you feel like um, attending from and traveling from nearby, uh, you can see all the information on our, our Discord channel. There's a there's a specific channel for those kinds of announcements. So do uh, come over there and, and check it. Uh, in case anyone is watching and are not yet on our community, I will let everyone know that these calls are open to our community members and there is uh, no real restriction on who can join at the moment. So I'm gonna share a link here in the chat where you can go and and join the community. So if you are only a YouTube follower or maybe you're watching this uh, by chance, uh, you can hop on that link and uh, join our community and get on discussions, conversations, uh, attend events like these, uh, be, uh, uh, and be notified when there's any announcements, any uh, focus groups. We have a few actually quite active now going on uh, uh, ramifications of mathematical physics in other disciplines. We also have one on uh, specifically a tool that is being developed for data visualization and community data visualization at SEMF. Um, we have one about entropy and free energy, which is, uh, yes, quite uh, connected to today's uh, topic on bioelectricity. Um, and generally, we are very open to any uh, topic that can be proposed as a, a biweekly theme. So as you, many of you know, we organize our weeks, uh, our, our activity, our community activity in biweekly chunks. Um, each bi-weekly cycle has a theme or a central topic that we try uh, to center around more or less, although there's obviously conversation going on about many, many topics all the time. So um, I don't really have much more to say uh, in, in the way of uh, general SAMP announcements. On, in the way of community, uh, I would uh, basically uh, update everyone that we are still working on the bot. So uh, the, I would remind everyone to use uh, SEMFCoin and to uh, uh, reward good comments uh, with SEMFCoin. SEMFCoin is the emoji uh, that you can type either by, by choosing it on the, on the tab or by writing semicolon, SEMFCoin semicolon, and that's the, how, you, how you can use it. It's a way to uh, track uh, what comments are valuable or, or valued by the community. So. Uh, please uh, go ahead and, and use that. Um, and not much else. So the other um, point of community conversation before we get into the uh, bioelectricity discussion and, and uh, maybe 
you can wait for, for some more time until people join to, uh, to discuss live. Again, if you're on YouTube, uh, don't, don't hesitate to come on the Discord to get the, the link to the call. Um, we can have a look at what the, what the bi biweekly themes have been. So I'm going to bring the Discord on the screen for the viewers on YouTube. So people on the call can just look at the Discord themselves. Um, and we can have a look at what the topics looked like last time that we discussed this. So let's see. So you can see here we have a schedule of biweekly themes, and uh, now we are on the bioelectricity one, uh, but it's finishing today. So I will uh, encourage all, all viewers to uh, just type on the chat what topics, what uh, cluster of topics, themes uh, you'd like to hear uh, from, from uh, the community next. So if you have any uh, pet favorites, uh, just uh, type them on the chat, uh, come on the Discord, uh, just tag uh, by weekly themes with, with, that, with that proposal, and then uh, we'll make it so. It is very likely that uh, we will make the next bi-weekly cycle a, a precisely information continuum, so the, the workshop that we are organizing. So if you go over here, you navigate all the way down to workshops uh, in, in the Discord, you will see that uh, we have the axiomatic creation one that we did last time here in Madrid, and now we have the information continuum one. That is, uh, that is being organized uh, and is, is, is now all confirmed with location and everything uh, in Amsterdam uh, next week. So this is going to be taking place next uh, Saturday. So Saturday next week on uh, March 9th. Um, so by default, we will uh, we will set the biweekly theme for the next uh, period to be information continuum and uh, this this uh, large uh, topic of uh, as you can see on the screen, is reality ultimately discrete? How is information stored in different media? Uh, can there be forms of continuous or topological code? Um, are, uh, wh what is the nature of uh, vibratory signals in different media, like sound uh, or in electric circuits and things like that? Um, and also quite interestingly, in my opinion, is what is uh, the boundary between digital and analog computing? Wh when does a system become digital in, in a... In a in a more phenomenological sense, not just in a uh, sort of technological sense as we understand digital, but uh, when when is that transition taking place? And with the understanding that the matter tends to have this continuous form, at least at ma macro meso scales. Um, so these are the topics that will be uh, covered during the during the workshop in Amsterdam. But uh, we normally try to align our in-person workshops with our bi-weekly themes that are purely online and they're mostly conversations that take place over Discord and in this live streams. So um, the next one is going to be information continuum for the next couple of weeks. So Saturday next week, we will be in Amsterdam live discussing it. Uh, but otherwise we are quite open to uh, schedule many uh, themes afterwards. So uh, as I said, Feel free to come on the bi-weekly themes channel here at the top in the information category. Um, you will see that now we have quite a bit of room for topics to cover. Um, of course, we can revisit. There's been uh, quite a great success of bi-weekly themes turning into uh, focus groups. So one such success story was the world building um, bi-weekly theme, which began simply uh, in some conversations, uh, I think, uh, prompted by Paul Golding and by Irida Altman on our community that uh, were basically just asking each other, what kind of tools do you use in, in world building when you, when you write or when you, when you create? And that uh, was uh, turned into a suggestion to maybe have a feature a couple of weeks on the topic. And then that led up to a, a private discussion. That one was uh, held behind closed doors because we do a combination of publicly live streamed community discussions and also private ones, so everyone can feel more comfortable. Those who don't like to be um, broadcast uh, online um, can also participate. Um, and so it was very successful. We had a very, a very good crowd of people there. Um, and, uh, and so now that it's, it's turned into a focus group. So you can see here in this category, focus group category, we have a few active uh, groups, uh, one of them being um, world building. And so here's a, a general 
a conversation about uh, different forms of world building and, and people have their, their opinions, they share their experiences with kind of things they're working on or projects they are, they are aware of that, uh, that, that relate to world building and has been quite successful. Um, the Constellation tool, just to give some, some uh, reference, this is something that is very kindly being developed by two important members of the CEMS community, Mar and, uh, and uh, Fadi. Uh, Mar, of course, being the vice president, as many of you know, and uh, Fadi being a, a very uh, valued member of our, of our community. And um, we are hoping to be able to demonstrate something relatively soon. The idea is that uh, we will have a functional bit of, uh, bit of uh, software for the Amsterdam workshop next week. So um, that's something that is also coming. We, we, we will be, um, we'll be demonstrating that soon. So the idea is to have some kind of network visualization of uh, community interaction and, and develop some forms of uh, visualization and, and data representation of our own community, community behavior. And of course, we still have uh, multi-math physics, uh, which is essentially about different, how differential geometry can be applied in, in different fields, and free energy, which is about uh, these notions of entropy and free energy and all this complexity science and, and more biology, co cognitive science sort of oriented research um, that, that is going on. And uh, just they're still there, so a little bit less active these days because this was picked up from the summer school last summer, uh, and, uh, but still some, some ideas going on there. So anyway, that's more or less the update uh, on the community. Lots of interesting conversations are going on. We got quite a heated conversation recently about infinity. That's always a, an interesting uh, topic that, uh, that comes up and people have uh, some passionate ideas about. Um, but otherwise, uh, I think that's pretty much all the updates that we have on, uh, on our plate today. Um, so I will leave it a couple of minutes now for any questions or any um, comments that uh, people might have. If you want to find out something about the um, uh, upcoming workshop in Amsterdam, or if you have any general questions about SEMF, obviously this is the moment where we are uh, opening this little window into our uh, into our community, into our society. And uh, now we have a good representation of the board actually here, and Alvaro, the secretary, Alona, the treasurer, and myself, the president. And um, so these are these regular opportunities for anyone who wants to ask or to engage with us to you know, ask anything or, or tell us uh, anything. So I, I see a, a few uh, uh, what we didn't know before, uh, uh, some viewers here in the chat. So uh, feel free to say hi or um, ask anything. And otherwise, we will take uh, a few minutes until uh, we begin with a conversation on bioelectricity proper. Uh, so if you were planning to join the Zoom call and you're, you're waiting for it to be over, that's the time. By the way, Alvaro and Alona, was, was there anything in your mind that you should feel that we should update uh, the community about? Um, maybe announcing the, the release of the website, the update. Oh, yes, that's that's true. No, that's, that's, that's true. Yes, Even we are <laughs> very close to having a, a revamped. Uh, that's right. So uh, just to build some hype, because uh, we don't want to spoil anything, but uh, uh, the, the part of the internal work has been uh, actually a lot of um, re remodeling and re-editing of the website uh, uh, on on the on, on the main landing page of the of the SEMF website. So um, hopefully in in a, in a few days uh, we will have a, f a new landing page. So uh, watch out for that because it's coming. It's coming very soon. Okay, so we'll give a couple of minutes of break and uh, just the people who want to join or we're, we're waiting for the community live stream proper to end uh, so they can, they can come online and we can have a discussion here. So here, someone is uh, saying hola to Alona in the chat. Luis Miguel Samperio, so. By the way, I, I... Uh, met Luis Miguel Samperio once, actually. All right. Because he's a friend of, of Carlos Blanco, a friend of ah. one random day years ago. All right, all right, right, right. 
Yeah, we we'll work together on something related to biofilm. Oh, really? And I think uh, I I don't see the messages, but uh, why list me? Don't you join and talk about the uh, paper you wanted to present? Oh yeah. So uh, I guess uh, let me see. Maybe they actually updated their. In a second. So it might be that. Oh, hello there, Fogas. Can see you. Welcome to the virtual nexus. Um, okay. So they didn't click on interested. Uh, so um, if Luis Miguel would like to join the live the conversation live here. Um, I am now just sending the link to the to the Zoom call because I, I saw that they joined the server today. By the way, I have a question. It's the first time I'm joining like this um, live stream uh, live. Uh, is it going to be like a discussion around some specific uh, like presentation that was before, or it's like open discussion? It's open discussion. So actually, um, when we move to the to the discussion proper, which we can probably do as as we speak now, um, the, the well, the idea is that we we are announcing that. Um, there's a new video on our channel. There's a highlight from Michael Levin. Um, we know that uh, the YouTube population as a whole is fond of our Michael Levin videos because those are the, the ones that are the most popular. So maybe I can just um, share the link here on the chat. I mean, you are if you are in the chat, you already see where this video is coming from, but just in case. Um, and for those of you watching, you can see that we have this, this video here, a technological approach to mind everywhere. Um, just as an excerpt from Michael's talk. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, you can share, you can uh, uh, leave your comments as usual. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's a primer for, for the, it's a primer for the conversation. So actually something that I was thinking is maybe we would like to watch the video live and then begin the conversation on that video. I don't know if uh, as, as a primer for the for the discussion here because I I didn't have a particular agenda uh, and unless you guys had a specific topic that you definitely wanted to begin the conversation we could just uh, live stream the video and watch it together and because I haven't watched the excerpt uh, Alvaro has has edited minimally and and, uh, uh, and I I can't remember exactly what Michael said and it would be a good refresher for for myself yeah maybe a good idea yeah okay so let's do that. Um, let's see what's the best way to do this. Um, I would probably, yes, I think the best way to do this is to simply go to the Oh, I see this comment from Halvard Stemmel. Um, right. So yes. So this live stream is uh, what we call a community live stream. So it's where we uh, essentially explain, uh, open the little window to see behind the scenes. Uh, if you are familiar with the videos on the uh, on the channel, um, thanks for saying they're interesting. I think that's uh, that's uh, something we all agree on. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, we try to communicate and have a moment of community discussion. Uh, it, it sometimes. As, as, as last time, it, it is quite popular and we have a, 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 a sort of an affluence of people around the topics. So other times it's more just us giving some updates and it's quicker, but uh, it's very much open for anyone to join. Uh, so the way to get into Discord and to uh, get into the live conversation is by joining the Discord with a link uh, to join SEMF, uh, which is free of charge and just requires uh, for you to give an email and, uh, and a couple of uh, uh, bits of information about your disciplinary uh, interests, and uh, once you have that, you will get a link to join the Discord, and, and you can be on 
on, on, the, on the Zoom calls and everything. Um, so let me see. I will probably just share the screen um, with everyone here on Zoom. So everyone sees this. Oh, but I think the quality is going to be low because it was just uploaded. Um, all right, so I think that should be going through to the YouTube channel. Yes, I can see that it's going through. So if you're okay with it, let's hit play, it's 10 minutes and then we discuss. I'm going to talk about uh, my framework, which I call TAME, stands for Technological Approach to Mind Everywhere. And uh, the most important part of this thing is that the, I, I will argue that the, the philosophy actually matters. It drives new discoveries. I'm going to show you uh, some things that we've done that are uh, directly emerging from a, a, sp a specific way we think about these things that otherwise was, was not found. I just want to show you a few new things uh, related to this to this framework. So the interesting thing about uh, trying to um, put all of these uh, di very diverse uh, agents, for example, a collective tissues and navigating morphous space um, together uh, with conventional agents on the uh, on the same scale is that you can you can come up with a with a central invariant, which uh, which I have picked as the spatiotemporal size of the largest goal you can pursue. So, so all agents have in common one fundamental thing, which is that they pursue goals. And so now the question is, are you only interested in the local sugar concentration? And you have a memory of a couple of minutes back and a predictive capacity of a couple of minutes forward, and then you might be a bacterium. Or do you have a bigger cognitive light cone and you might have a memory going backwards and uh, 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 some predictive capacity going forwards, but you're never going to care about what happens in three months, two towns over. So you might be a dog if that's the case. Or you might be a human, which has a huge huge cognitive light cone and you're you're actively working towards world peace and the, what the financial markets are going to do 100 years from now you could have a huge cognitive light cone so this idea of and we of course are, are a compound intelligence where our cells have, have a little tiny light cones and our organs do and so do we and and possibly uh, larger structures in which we participate so this idea of a cognitive light cone is based around the goals that any particular system can follow and so that allows you to start thinking about what an individual actually is what are cells given that we're all collective intelligences we're made of parts we're you know basically a bunch of cells in a, in a trench coat how does the um how does the collectivity and the unification happen um well, let's look at the very early steps of, uh, of, of embryogenesis. Uh, this is an embryonic blastoderm. There might be 50,000 cells here. And we look at that and we say, ah, there's one embryo. What do we mean by one embryo? What are we counting? What is there one of? Well, what there's one of is alignment, not just physical alignment, although that's true too. Cells have to physically align with each other in planar polarity. But we are counting alignment of purpose. What we're saying is that under normal circumstances, all of these cells will work together to build exactly this thing they all th this whole blastoderm all of them together have this one goal and we know that because if we try to deviate they will try to compensate they are all together trying to get to this one goal we're counting uh we're counting um goals and alignment and they have a particular size of of this goal state that they're trying to fit uh it's actually quite interesting to ask how many selves are in here it's the same question with brains if you didn't already know what a human was and somebody showed you a human brain and said uh, in this volume of substrate, how many cells can fit there? And we actually really have, we, we would have no idea what, what the density of cells per unit material is, because what you can do is, and I used to do this as a grad student uh, in duck, uh, duck embryos, you can take a little, a little needle and you can make some scratches in this blastoderm like this. And when you do that, uh, for the next four or five hours before these things heal back up, each of these little islands is not going to be able to feel the rest. And it will decide that it is the embryo and everything outside is external world and they will make individual embryos and you get this you get conjoined twins and you can get uh, you can get any number of them. And so, so the question of how many embryos are here is actually not clear it's not set by the genetics it's the outcome of a dynamic process of autopoiesis or self construction every cell is some other cells neighbor they have to um. Uh, they have to figure out uh, who is part of is 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 this particular cell part of me as the embryo? Is it part of the outside world? Uh, and uh, and and that you, you, the, this this kind of um, uh, uh, 
generative medium, this excitable medium can give rise to zero, one, two, up to, you know, probably a half a dozen or so different selves. And the same thing is true uh, in the brain, actually. Um, and I think this goes back to that point about Turing, is we also, we, we typically feel like unified individuals, but we know from, from studies of split brain patients and dissociative identity disorders that there's actually not clearly just one self inside the medium of our, of our nervous system. And organs have to decide this too. Instead of making one giant eye, this one's decided to make three slightly smaller ones. Why? We have to understand how these different uh, collectives decide who is in and who's out. And this, is, this of course, has, has medical implications because uh, while evolution has given us uh, some nice um, uh, ways to, to, to uh, scale up our goals, so from the goals of individual cells to um, uh, uh, being able to, from, from, from pursuing little tiny goals like metabolic states and, 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 and proliferation and things like that, to, to working on these very large construction projects where no individual cell knows how many fingers you're supposed to have, but the collective does, because every time you amputate one, it'll grow exactly the right number. But that, that has, a, has a failure mode, and that failure mode is, um, uh, is cancer. So in cancer, this is human glioblastoma. These cells have electrically disconnected, and as far as they're concerned, the rest of the body is just uh, environment to them. And so that idea, that, that shifting boundary of the self, the shifting scale of the goals you care about from local single cell goals to large anatomical goals to once you're a neural human system, you know, much bigger goals than that, is, uh, is a way to uh, start addressing some, some biomedical problems, for example, cancer. What we've done here is um, we've uh, induced a, a, a human oncogene, and so they're going to make this tumor. But what we've also done is co-inject an ion channel that forces these cells to stay in electrical communication with their neighbors. So uh, we don't kill the cancer cells. We don't fix the oncogene. In fact, you can see here, the red is, is the oncoprotein. It's quite blazingly expressed. It's all over the place, but there's no tumor. This is the same animal. There's no tumor because, what, because the, the hardware is not what drives. It's not the genetics that drives. It's the physiology and the decision-making of the collective. And when you maintain the collective, it, the collective remembers that it has to make nice skin and muscle. It doesn't go off to, to tumorogenesis. So um, just to point out a couple of quick, a couple of quick and simple things. Um, uh, we, we, the basic development is, uh, is so um, reliable that we get, uh, we get lured into a false sense of uh, um, robustness, which is that, you know, we know that oaks make oak trees and we think, well, here's what the, uh, the oak um, genome can do. This, this acorn is going to make things like this, a nice flat green structure. But what we don't realize, and we don't know this until some parasite like, um, like a wasp prompts the cells with chemical signals to build something completely different. This is, an, uh, this is a gall formed from the plant cells under some simple prompting from this other creature. Here's another one. We would have no idea that uh, these, these cells with their standard genome could build something completely different. That morphous space, that latent space of possibilities, that behavioral space is unknown to us until we start to experiment by probing it with various uh, various signals, um, and this is so 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 this this is this is very profound. This idea that that uh, living things hack each other constantly, and it's not just parasites that hack the host, but all of the cells of an embryo are constantly hacking each other in the sense of putting out signals to get them to do what the collective wants them to do. So that kind of um, we can now uh, we can now uh, say that that uh, synthetic. Um, constructs like, like these xenobots that we have made uh, are a tool together with, the xenobot is actually, it's not this little tiny thing that we make, it's actually this whole structure, including the environment, um, uh, including high agency aspects of the environment, like we, the bioengineers, and lower agency uh, aspects of the environment, like chemical signals and so on, is a way to look into the various spaces that a collective might be traversing. And these might be uh, behavioral, physiological, transcriptional, and, and many others that we may not know. So um, I'm just going to uh, summarize my points here, which is to say that uh, in, this, in this framework, we look at a continuum of agency. Um, we, I, I don't like binary categories. I think they're completely artificial. Um, I think these questions are empirical. Uh, they are not uh, philosophical. We have to do the experiments and see which substrates have what capacities. We can define selves as a boundary of goals that the collective system is capable of pursuing, but it's on us as observers to recognize those goals in an optimal way. And we're not very good at it. We need a better science of, of, of doing it. Um, developmental bioelectricity as the ancient precursor of what nervous systems do is one kind of cognitive glue that binds 
competent subunits towards larger scale selves. And uh, evolution, uh, of course, interacts with this whole process, but in a bi-directional way. And so the last thing I want to point out is simply this, that uh, when Darwin looked at the uh, richness of variety in the biological world, he, he coined this phrase, endless forms, most beautiful. Uh, all of the natural forms are here. They're a tiny little corner of the possible state space of every combination of evolved material, engineered material, and software. All of these things, hybrids, hybrids and cyborgs and hybrids and, and chimeras of various kinds, many of these already exist and many more are going to exist because all of this is possible because life is so interoperable. And the reason it's so interoperable is that uh, evolution makes problem solving machines. It, it, the, all of these, um, uh, all of these uh, systems have to, they, they, they don't take their past uh, experiences too seriously. They don't overtrain on their priors. They have to solve problems from scratch every single time. And thus novelty is not surprising to them. They're dealing with a, uh, with a, with a, with a very unreliable medium. They, they basically, the whole architecture assumes that things are going to be broken. Things are not going to work the way you expect. And you have to solve problems from scratch. And for this reason, all of these things are viable. And that means that um, going forward in the next uh, couple of decades, we are going to be surrounded by creatures that are nowhere on the tree of life with us. We cannot use the old familiar uh, strategies of asking where on the tree of life is it? Is it more like a snake or a dog or a dolphin? Or a, a, w w these things are gonna be nowhere on that, um, on that scale. And the old uh, categories of is it, is it, is it uh, engineered versus natural? Is it a machine versus an organism? All of these crisp categories are gonna become completely useless. I mean, they were, they were never correct, but at least in the olden days, they were a rough, a rough heuristic that you could use. And so we're gonna to need to develop a new form of ethics for relating to minds that are, that, are, uh, that are not like ours. And that's really critical. By the way, he is not mentioning who is the main commander or like the initiator of all of that electricity. Uh, because if we speak about um, joining those cancer cells back into the system, uh, like the question who is responsible for that process? And I mean, the whole mechanics of it, because uh, we can think that I am responsible, but if I am including this, not I am, uh, if a person who is sick includes those also cancer cells, then how, who should identify where it's self, not self, and how to incorporate them back? That like, because it's not the, it's not the um, doctor's mission to manage this, I think. I wonder also if they have done some tests of really um, if this uh, concept really works. Do you know, Carlos, about that? Uh, about uh, incorporating back uh, cancer cells into normal cells uh, system. I speak about cancer cells. Returning them into normal cells returning them in the state of normal cells. So was it the like real experiment? Because I missed this moment uh, with the results of that the person was healed. Ah, so it was like separate artificial growth, yeah? In what? In what? Mm. So I wonder how is it because like outside of the organism, the thinking organism, it's like one experiment. But when it isn't because the thinking organism caused this separation. So how would be this reversed?
So it's application of some external electrical impulses, right? Mm. That's what my question was about. Like, how would they uh, deal with this in the in like uh, in the human organism that is like the patient, the real patient? Mm. Yeah. But it would be great if uh, a person would be able to like change the setup, you know, <laughs> and to um uh reconnect back with the parts of the body that were rejected ah because he his general idea is like we are collective body yeah a person is not the individual it's collective so uh the question is who is the main commander who holds all the cells together and who decides to block them out or to integrate them back into the whole electrical system, you know? So self-organization. <laughs> Then, then my, for example, I'm not uh, uh, reorganized to be part of you. <laughs> like part of me not reorganizing to be part of you. I was off, so nobody could hear me. <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, Alejo, for the, yeah. Sorry. Um, I guess this is an interesting point uh, to expand on, actually. What, what point? Uh, uh, this aspect of, okay, what is the actual structure? Uh, and, and I think about this in analogy to governance. Mm -hmm. and organ let's take social organizations. So yes. there's various kinds of structures you have about decision-making uh, and how... Uh, and basically subsidiarity, like who is exactly the one taking decision at this certain with this certain context in this certain environment, and you know you can have like extremely higher, like totally hierarchical, like pyramidal structures, or you can have very flat uh, organizations. But the thing is, in truth, uh, you always have something in the middle, like a, a, pol a polycentric kind of model. And the thing is that. Um, I don't know, uh, like the, this this aspect of, uh, like a, a, a unitary kind of self. Uh, it's, it's really. I, I think it's like Alana's um, concern is actually pretty on point. It is still an open question. Uh, like we can talk about like because in organizations we can talk about like uh, execution. Uh, and it can happen at the nodes. So like you can have like a kind of decentralized duocracy, let's say, where people take decisions uh, about their specific like work uh, um, role 
uh, according to their own situation, according to their own expertise in their own environment. Mm -hmm. And they are the, the, the better judges of their own situation. There's nobody who is a commander who like commands like how one is to act in the situation. But the thing is, um, even when that is the case, that is only one part of um, the, the decision-making structure because... For example, like when it comes to how information flows, there might be like most of it can be uh, aggregated by like a central, like let's say the, the leader or the EC or whatever, um, as the information like integration kind of center. So uh, this um, maybe like we could say that we can view like the human metabolism as a whole in a way, uh, uh, or we can view the of the functional autonomy of the nervous system as a whole um and say okay like the the broad the final product of it is however we call it might be kind of like this information integration um uh, center and this might relate to cell food and how this goal uh, goals at different uh scales of organization uh are integrated locally mm -hmm. and so like um, I think, yeah, it is not that clear what happens in that respect. If we talk in these respects about like the, the structure, the organizational structure of a body in terms of bioelectricity habit. Yeah. Because and it's also when we about... enter, when we enter like the domain of electricity, we also deal with electromagnetism and with electrical fields. So, uh, and it's like when you, understand the electrical fields you also understand that we are not like uh disconnected from the outer context uh, beings we are very deeply incorporated in the context through those fields because uh, uh, our bioelectrical system produces the biofield yeah like our earth has biofield or uh, has its like uh, field around that protects us from radiation well, but that, but, but Alana, just to be clear, that that field has nothing to do with life going on on Earth, because that that is generated by the ferro ferronucleus, right? So no, no, no. I'm just uh, well. In our body, we also have uh, fer um, iron. Iron, sure. And we have and and it is one of the most important elements of our blood. Without iron, we are not producing oxygen. Yes, but and but without the... oxygen, we are not functioning. Yes, yes, yes. But 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 there, there's. It's important not to conflate, right? So one thing is the iron in hemoglobin and the other thing is iron in the center of the earth that's rotating. And but but when field. we speak about electricity, we can, um, it's like similar things, not like well, maybe I mean, biological. But, but, okay, but everything is uh, is electromagnetism because everything at our scale is yes. governed by electromagnetism. Even a, a wire, if it is like has a pretty like strong flow of electricity but, 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 the current it it has the electricity yes yes but my, my point no so wait wait so uh, what my, my was my point is uh like when we speak about we are not individual self cells we are collective cells on the level of like this boundary skin boundary but when we go to the level of like electricity in general like we are electrical beings and we are deal we have our uh, personal uh, electrical field and we deal with external electrical fields which are other people uh, like uh, the uh, the whole sorry, like no the... no I mean we I, I, let's be clear I mean human beings don't produce electrical fields this is I mean we don't produce the we don't have the capacity there's no there's no enough charge that is displaced anywhere for a human being to produce an effective electrical field anywhere because we are essentially neutral beings uh, neutral chunks of matter, right? So the elect an electrical field requires a displacement of charge and a human body does not have enough uh, charge displacement for an electrical field to be created. Maybe it's not that uh, significant that people were not really like talking about before, but um, like very sad that Luis, Mid Luis Miguel didn't join because he holds uh, the paper of uh, uh, bioelectrical field. Yes. And so what I wanted to say that we are incorporated in the whole electromagnetic context. Sure. So when we speak about also like how our bodies uh, 
operate on the electrical level. We are also connected to the whole context around but, us. But, but okay, but let's let's be clear about something. So everything, all matter that we interact with, is electromagnetic matter, right? Because at our scale of energy, there's only atoms, and atoms are bound essentially by electromagnetism, and all our interactions are mediated by electromagnetism. But that's not to say that everything is interconnected and it's causally related because of the interaction that it mediates is the same, right? So that, that there's an important distinction because n not everything is causally related, right? Because there's... I, I, yeah. I guess it may be similar as saying that everything is created, everything is creating some kind of gravitational field, exactly. but that doesn't imply that we are effectively gravitationally affecting each other. Well, actually, it's a good analogy, but actually, gravitationally, it is true. However, well, I mean, however small the, the effect, it is true that everything gravitates because it's sure. Like, but you know, yeah, yeah, for sure. But uh, although there is some non-zero effect, mm -hmm. strictly speaking, uh, it doesn't imply that this effect is meaningful or impactful. Yes. In no, no, but okay. In, in that sense, it's similar. But the difference is that so saying something like the the fact that there's life on earth might have an effect on an electromagnetic field that you can uh, sorry a magnetic field that you can uh, that you can observe like the magnetic field of the earth that's um that's not comparable to something like the gravitational field of earth because you know a, a, a kilogram of biological matter contributes the same to gravity as a kilogram of the nucleus or a kilogram of water or whatever right? like it's because it's just mass right so, but that's not the same with electromagnetism. Electromagnetism has this qualification of charge and current to, to be, so, so that fields gen are generated, right? So uh, the fact that there's life on earth doesn't have an effect on the magnetic field of the, of the planet, for example, because the magnetic field of the planet comes from the fact that there's, there's this m charge, the ferromagnetic uh, moment uh, in, uh, in, in the atoms of, of, of the nucleus spinning around and that creates the magnetic field. Right, so I think we should uh, speak here about uh, the levels of um, influence, let's say. Of course, the, the core of the Earth is the most influential one. Well, but uh, it's not the most the influential one. Is that you need, we know that a magnetic field is created by a current, right? So if but I, if we are running currents, because uh, yes, I but, know but, that there are some... So there's something very important about electromagnetism, which is there has cancellative effects, right? There's positive and negative charge. So there's positive and negative current. So there's such a thing as a neutral uh, current, right? So, or zero current. That's not, that's not comparable to gravity, for example. Gravity is always additive. So you can't shield off gravity because it's always additive, but you can definitely shield off electricity because if, there is an, if there's a neutral current and a neutral charge, then you have no electromagnetic. That's how cancer cells shield themselves, you know, from uh, being incorporated in the whole. Not really, because they can be embedded in a non-zero electric field or magnetic field and still be cancerous. Because the point is not the fact that they are sealed off from some general sense of electricity. They are sealed off from a specific kind of electricity signaling that they are not, you know, behaving correctly. So. That's why it's important to distinguish very carefully when, when talking about electricity. It's not that, oh, it's electricity, then everything goes. It's really, you know, electricity signals of a certain kind, which is more or less electrochemical, because it's really more about the distribution of electrical fields on the membranes of cells than saying there's an electric field here. Because I mean, you can create an electric field by rubbing something that, you know, displays charges. So it's more like static electricity rather than current. Well, the opposite is more like current than static electricity. So, an electric field is, is is created by static electricity. Currents create magnetic fields, right? So, you you can create an electric field by rubbing anything. You take some glass, you rub it. There's some electricity. There's some electric field in that region because there's displaced charge, right? Um, but but you know the cells around there don't don't feel anything about that because they they, they are neutral on average, right? So only things that have some positive or negative charges are going to feel. The, the fields uh, around them, right? But, but cells are essentially neutral. I mean, you can, you can circle them around and say there's no influx or outflux of, uh, of charge or current. And then that effectively makes them 
sort of transparent to, to electromagnetism. But inside there, there can be processes that are, that, that are you know, they have inhomogeneous charge distributions, for example, the membranes and how the, you know, the neural, I mean, this is the reason why you can enter a magnetic field and nothing happens to you. Have you ever tried to check your electrical, what, what is the name of the tool that you can check just electricity current? Well, the, the superficial, the electrical just... gun or what? No, 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 the, the one uh, that like people who work with electricity use. So I just have a friend who has this tool and she's sometimes checking other people and uh, she also like put it to me and we all emit uh, it with all people. It was showing different numbers with some people. It was like going crazy yes. and you can see that those people are like really like you stand near them and you can feel it, you know? Mm. No, no, there's, you, you can accumulate charge. So, so that's very important. For example, we're working with electronics, um, grounding yourself, for example, you, your body can accumulate superficial charge, right? And that's why you sometimes bump into each other and you, you give a little shock and so on. But what the distinction I'm trying to make, make here just for clarity of everyone's listening as well, is that the fact that there's electromagnetic fields uh, in the space that are produced by displaced, displaced charges and, and currents um, doesn't necessarily imply that those things have effects on phenomena that is obviously electromagnetically mediated, but is nonetheless neutral as a whole, right? Because the, the, the I mean, when you, when you study the interaction, the electromagnetic interaction, you realize that there's this so-called Gauss, Gauss's theorem, right? The, the Gauss's theorem essentially tells you that you can round a region, you can enclose a region, and you, you only need to me measure the amount of stuff that is going in or going out. And in this case, stuff is ch electrical charge. And once you know that, you know exactly how the system is going to behave. So it doesn't matter exactly what are the details. The only thing that matters is that there's a net flux of, of charge. And so if there's no net flux of charge, that thing is equivalent to empty space, effectively, for electromagnetism, right? So that's why you, we go through you know, all the radiations that, that are going around. There's a lot. Nothing happened to us because we are essentially neutral. Right? We are, we don't, we don't engage with that, and and so that's important to to distinguish the the fact that it's called bioelectricity shouldn't distract you from the fact that those are phenomena of uh, electrical and electrochemical signals in in membranes of, of cells and so on. So these are, in some sense, these are highly sophisticated processing chips in a way. It's like bio, biological chips that are processing information in a specific way. Um, similar reason why you can have computers and except for some sensitive parts, you can have magnets around them and they, they are not immediately destroyed, right? Except, as I say, except for some sensitive components, you can have them in magnetic fields and they, and they survive, right? Because they are, a computer is largely neutral. Right? It doesn't have a, a displaced charts inside. Um, but anyway, so there's one question in the chat uh, I want to address. Uh, Alejo is asking, has Michael identified who or what is creating the bioelectric bioelectrical fields that work as a blueprint for cell or gene expression? That's the biggest question I have from your presentation. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, that's a very good question. Um, what is creating the bioelectrical field? So, so I, always, I always like to think of uh, genetics and in ontogeny, right? When there's a development of an organism, you begin from a, from a single cell and it develops into a multicellular organism. Um, you know that the genetic code or the genetic information in that in that organism is somehow a packaging of the process that is going to come after. It's almost like the instructions to do something, but obviously it doesn't contain the actual thing. And having the instructions with context uh, is what leads to a result. So if context changes, then the result is going to change. Even the, the instructions are the same. And that's essentially the main tenant of Michael, right? That your instructions in your genome are the same, but if the context changes, the instructions apply differently. You know, you have a, a, a instruction that tells you, you know, walk straight and then turn turn left. If there's no way to turn left, you can't follow the instructions in some sense, right? So, um, so in, in a way, that's kind of the, uh, the, the gist. Now, exactly how that happens, nobody knows because, um, it's, it's, I think uh, uh, it's possible to bring here the example of snowflakes. They don't have DNA, but they also mm -hmm. 
their development uh, response yes, yes, to yes. the exactly. context. It's a very good it's a very good example actually because snowflakes have the same underlying mechanism that, that they form, but because of the little randomness of imperfections, they always form a bit differently. Um, exactly because of that. So the genetic is the same because it's the same molecule, eyes, uh, hexagonal symmetry, all that stuff. That's common. But the details of how those instructions are followed are going to depend exactly on context of like temperature distribution and imperfections here or there or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's a very good example. That's that's a that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, so there's like a kind of necessity, like a like a mathematical necessity in these kind of structures, like the, the same as like a, a beehive, like mm -hmm. hexagonal structures. Um, they, 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 they are necessarily. This is the structure that necessarily emerges out of, out of peace, trying to create mm -hmm. neighboring cells between each other. Yes. Uh, with some pattern, so uh, or bubbles like the the internal uh, shapes of like pulling like four bubbles together. Yeah. Uh. So is is it that kind of is it that kind of necessity that we're talking about? Um... Uh. And and then what are the Components, uh, because uh, we you've got to have some constraints on the system, like creating this. But like, it's not exactly clear which they are. Which, uh... yeah. I mean, I, I I actually don't know about honeycomb patterns of these. Um, I have never read on on the on the details of it, but because it's unclear whether the pattern emerges from the bee's nervous system, so, or whether it emerges from a very automaton-like behavior where each bee is effectively executing a very simple algorithm, and then the, the emergent pattern is that of a honeycomb, right? Um, I'm not sure about that, um, but it could be either way. I mean, I, I can, because for example, the. The spider web, right? Um, the spider web is, web is known to be in the spider's nervous system, right? So, so, so that that design, um, not the full design because the, the, design, the design is obviously flexible, uh, but the instructions for the design are are known to be in sort of in the organism of the spider, right? The spider has that. Yeah. That's today. Uh, like, I'm not. So yeah. That's something like uh, adding a little bit of like the kind of environmental perspectives in cognitive science. Yeah. Like there's there's some like pushback against this idea of like a predefined script that is just run yeah. um, like cognitively because always you have to deal with a certain kind of. In, well, I, I mean, the, the thing is, what exactly is the script? Like th that there is a script, is that there is a protocol is clear, mm -hmm. but the, but like that the whole structure, the whole shape of the structure is encoded it, in that it protocol. Is, it's it like is, a design. It is not. It is. So like, um, there is the aspect of like the environmental constraint. So you see this line. So you know that this line will go by this specific angle because the previous line was by this specific yes. angle also. Exactly. So, uh, so. So, so um, it, it seems like a kind of like balance, right? Like a balancing act mm -hmm. <laughs> between these two, yeah, in a way. Yeah, no, and I think biology has done that a lot, right? Where I mean, you could even you could even imagine uh, the genetic code being an extreme of that, right? Where could it be the genetic code, the commander of the system? Not really. That that we know that that's not the case at all because we know that the genetic code can be a is an informational funnel. So it, it is it is a I like to think of the genetic code as a compression uh, mechanism for so so you compress the instructions so that you can then go and become something in an in an environment right and but 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 it's not the actual thing in the end because in the genetic code there is no brain there is no nervous system there is no network the topology of a, of a nervous system network is nowhere represented in the genetic code there's no way to map um, anatomy to the genetic code there's no way to map all those things i mean people tried people thought they could 
when they started the, the program in genetics in the very beginning, they thought, oh, if we if we spot the gen, the gene for arm length, the gene for this, the gene for that, and that pro program essentially failed entirely. I mean, we didn't know if that wasn't the case, but it seems that it really is not the case that the you don't have function biological function and form directly encoded in in the in the genes, right? What you have is some highly uh, highly compact and highly um, redundant uh, set of instructions that are going to develop into di different things in different contexts, right? So when the context is an embryo in the right conditions and so on, what you get is the organism that sort of evolution sort of selecting in that particular strand of, of, of selection, right? But, um, but we know that there are no, um, we know that the, the genetic code doesn't speak of the organism that develop, develops from it. And the proof is, you know, you, well, Michael Levin's work is absolutely one of the most obvious uh, and more clarifying uh, evident pieces of evidence we have for that. But also, um, the when there are twins, when there are genetically identical twins, that they develop into similar but very different people. Um, that's also uh, kind of a deterministic proof that that's not that's not the case, right? So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's very interesting. I, I think that I like to think of biology as this biological phenomenon as uh, this the process of the universe discovering this information storing mechanisms because the, the example of the of the spider for example um i always think of it and think right so at some point um there was some kind of arthropod that had a way of making silk for some context or whatever and then it became advantageous or in some way to explore the possibilities of creating webs in, in some way and so you, you can't imagine, I mean, natural selection doesn't tell you that spiders are going to develop the ability to do these beautiful, efficient uh, webs for, for hunting and for like trapping uh, prey, but it's almost as if evolution decided, okay, let's explore that, which is what Michael was talking about, right? Let's explore that um, face space of hunting uh, techniques and and you know, let's. Uh, and it, and so, did you see the experiment when spiders were exposed to acid and yes. amphetamine and cocaine, and they were making different webs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's and that's, also, that's why we know it's in the nervous system. That's exactly why we know it's in the nervous also system. today. I posted in regards of uh, Mars development the yeah. web uh, that uh, it was just like the sequence of thinking, you know. Um, there was uh, one research which um, was published, like spoken about in Quantum Magazine, and um, they said that um, spiders' web are actually the extension of uh, cognition yes. of the spider. Yes. Mm. So yeah, yeah. they, yeah. so their their networks. It's I think what we have impulses in our like brains, how we fire up. I think they just like uh, build these uh, uh, patterns in the webs. Yep. You know what's happening in that respect? So basically, when you have a web, uh, um, and let's say something like a, an insect fly uh, flies and uh, drops on a specific um, location, basically this creates a, like a vibrational pattern and oscillation, and you can like the, the spider can know spatially where it is in the web. Uh, because of like the, the speed of how it travels, there's a kind of like an understanding of that in the way that we understand like difference between mu different musical notes mm -hmm. and how they uh, relate to different kinds of um, uh, like different bands of the frequency spectrum. In the same way, they can understand this spatially. And like this, there's a cool video of somebody who has built actually a musical e equipment that is built like a web spider that has the same mm -hmm. geometry and it uses this principle <laughs> yeah it's actually interesting this uh, what you just mentioned maybe we bring this up at our conversation at uh, about uh, continuum information mm -hmm. oh yeah no this is super relevant for the conversation mm -hmm. on continuum and information because um, let's keep it there <laughs> yes 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 let's put a pin on it um the, the thing i like about so, so this is this is the idea of the this is the idea of um, extended cognition or embodied cognition, right? Where where you have uh, the spider's uh, cognitive uh, mechanisms being extended on on the web. Um, I mean, we humans have 
are the absolute masters of extended cognition in, in a way, because uh, I mean, we have embodied, we, we are doing this thing right now, like in this virtual call with this technology, which is the one of the most amazing examples of uh, extended cognition, right? Because we we brought these pieces of like crystallized sand and, and, and you know electrical circuits and we made them behave as if they have a thinking mind like ours and they, have, they can they can do boolean logic and things like that and boolean logic is an extremely high level cognitive function even though we think of it as oh it's a simple logic whatever it's something that biology does very rarely like actually finding boolean processing in the in the natural world is very rare um and so we, we think of the, the boolean by, by boolean i mean um kind of a contrast of, of binary values or, and, and kind of running with hypotheses of binary values and things like that. It's extremely rare to find that in the, in the real world uh, and it just out in, in the wild. But as humans, we are sort of naturally spontaneously doing it when, when we develop language and we develop this sort of higher cognitive function. Um, so to me, it's, uh, I mean, it's not fashionable to say that because everyone knows technology because we are all in culture to technology because we are part of this civilization. But um, when you look at technology as a biological phenomenon of like these human animals producing it, it's an absolutely amazing case of extended cognition. It's kind of a trivial, you know, proof by a trivial example. It's like, yes, th this is a thing because we have done it. Um, but obviously, Mother and child uh, sensing each other is also extended cognition. Well, not, not the same because, I mean, it's a different example because this is, a, this is something that you, um, extended cognition re refers to things that are not, organic or not part of the of the organism originally and that nonetheless um are, are in i mean michael actually mentioned it in the video they, they said that when they created the xenobots um that, which are these things i think xenobots if i remember correctly were uh, bits uh, cells extracted from skin um and that they were isolated so they were no longer in context of like other layers of tissue and whatnot and so they start behaving in a specific way, which is very simple. They start to like circle around and gather, gather food and whatever. So they call those things xenobots. And when he plays the diagram, he said that the xenobots are the particular response to the preparation of the experiment, the scientists and, and so on. And they are using this environment because that's not the xenobots, right? We can say the xenobot is this system and the scientists that are preparing the solution with sugar or something is a different system and they can interact. And, but with mother and child, um, there is a there's a continuity of uh, of causality between them, and that, that's kind of the important thing. That they're by definition of mother and child, right? Like there's the, you have a direct informational causality between the two. So I wouldn't be like I don't think you would normally qualify it as um, extended cognition because in a sense it's a genealogical cognition. I mean it's kind of a in but sense. in in the situation of like couples that are true couples. Not like open relationship, <laughs> uh, but uh, true couples. Uh, there are many evidences that uh, they really sense each other. So here is no geological connection. I wouldn't say that's, that's the extended cognition would be the right word. No. Although there is something going on there. So for example, this like uh, like um, uh, th this is actually um, a tradition in in therapy, either in family therapy or. Uh, Couples therapy of cyber of cybernetics of like second order cybernetics. So basically, the like a dyad, like um, the uh, partners are structurally coupled in a way. Uh, they can be seen as functioning as a, as, as, a, as a as a single system Absolutely. in function. Absolutely. Uh, and and share function and and actually like maintaining this autopoetically, like maintaining an actual circle. circle yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, sure. Function. Or dancers, dancers is dancers, a, like yes, a big, uh, yes. big, yeah, 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 yeah. The no, dance only it. exists once once this uh, like uh, structurally coupled system is together, yeah. and and dissolves. Uh, I think it's all about improvisation in general. Like, for example, like jazz improvisation. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like when the whole group sensing each other, where the whole thing is moving. Yes, you know? yes exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's 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 that. But but again, the, I think the just to clarify, because this has been a quite a popular theme in, in, in SEMF events. Uh, we, when we say extended cognition or embodied cognition, we usually refer to systems that are otherwise not cognitive, who are, which are now part of a, of a cognitive process. So, so you know, you, you take out the spider from the spider web, 
the web doesn't do anything, right? Like it's, it doesn't, so, so that's the thing. If you have two spiders collaborating on a community, that's a different thing because the two things are independently cognitive, same as partners or just musicians. Like they are independently cognitive uh, and agent, but in this, in these situations, you, you are um, using a substrate that doesn't have a behavior that is recognized as cognitive to extend the cognition as I say, a computer is an extreme. I, I think I think the music uh, that a group of uh, uh, like uh, jamming improvisers produce it is the web, <laughs> and uh, those are spiders <laughs> that are developing the web. Yeah, but it's like way. several spiders yeah. on the web. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's that's right. So the music itself is the extended cognition. Yes. It's actually very interesting. Uh, I was spending some time really observing how people do improvised art. And I can tell you it's certain level of um, development of, let's say, psyche, of cognition, of really like sensing self, other, and the whole. Hmm. It's yeah. uh, not many people are capable for this. For this, you, you probably have more experience. I, I have very little experience improvising with other people. You being one of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm currently in a in an improvisation only like band. Uh, right. So yeah, <laughs> and that's interesting because like I've always like and I've been taking um, care of actually like recording stuff. So there's recordings and actually. Uh, Having also the experience of like working with transcripts and like a, like mm -hmm. like digital anthropology and stuff like that, um, if you see a recording of a jam session of a whole jam session, like so let's talk about ours as a as a um, as a transcript in a way, yeah, and analyze it in the same way. It, it, um, so there are moments of communication. Um, that happen like you can see how an idea develops yes uh, uh step by step with uh, small components and see its whole genealogy well like in musical products that's uh, like let's say it is a composition yes and it's written and it's produced and it's being published you don't see that um and so yeah like to to be the, the cognition required usually is one where there's also there's both the micro level like this very like quick judgments being made uh about like the style uh, or the um the specific timing like these are very small elements but you have to have the whole th um uh if it fits in a whole like if there's very various people and all the elements fit um it is more likely if all of the people are uh, paying attention also not only to micro judgments, uh, but also to where the whole thing is going, the trajectory and the progression of the whole thing. Yeah. So yeah, that, what, you said, what you said, thing. what you what you said is actually like quite like observation. But I, I don't know. There's probably a lot of research that has been done on this, uh, but it's I very obscure. I think I could <laughs> even like touch those <laughs> and uh, like thinking, <laughs> because when you see how people go into this like development of the uh, composition, it's like people are not in their minds. It's like people somehow extend their mm -hmm. thinking into yes, collective yes. Uh, pool and like here individuals become as like collective cells and form yeah, yeah, yeah. other definitely. other body definitely no i can i can i can attest to that even when improvising alone that um if you really force yourself to to carry on and and not stumble and just sort of enter this flow state you i think that the better improvisations happen when you disembody in some sense like you just forget that you are that you're an agent and you're essentially just so I can imagine. So I had a I had a little experience of improvisation of group improvisation in New York when I went to uh, I, I, I went so I was in in Brooklyn and we we got into a random pizza place and then there was sound coming from the basement and randomly there was a there was a jam session going on in the, in the basement of a pizzeria. It was pretty funny. Um, so I came down and there were like about seven people jamming with like several keyboards and drums and a bass and whatnot. Um, so I, you know, I asked permission, say, can I, can I get on the keyboard a little bit? Um, and the experience that I had was very clearly that 
uh, I identified the key they were playing and, and I played what I thought were essentially three notes, three descending notes. And then the bass player, who was absolutely amazing, um, picked that up and that became the germ of effectively like a song that actually someone came on and rapped over. And there was like this like five minute long song kind of thing. Um, and, and it was interesting to see that, I mean, I had very little experience. So I was basically just vibing with them. I, I was not doing much. Uh, but when I got in, because my style is usually doing some kind of melodic patterns, uh, they picked up the, those, oh, right, the, those notes are whatever what works here. And those became like a motif that just built an entire song uh, form, essentially. Um, so it was, it was it's a actually around... very... Yeah. So they try to like create space, basically, uh, for, for, for your uh, tune, for your pattern, right? What do you mean? To, to to create space in the in, in the whole composition, let's say in whatever place, like somebody yeah. plays the bass, somebody plays like the the keyboard. So like because you play the melody, right. did you sense this? Like they try to create space, right, right, for the melody to be there, and then take this and reintegrate it. Uh, spot of the is, isn't this what happened? No, it, it's not, there yeah. is no that logic first and was second. I think it's just happening. You know? Well, it was, it was oh, fairly, there, there is, there is, but no, it is like it a complementary. Linear. It was fairly linear because when I got in, they they just finished sort of a set, and there, and it was just a, a a drum groove going in the background, so everyone was quiet. And so I entered on the keys, identified that that uh, that they had been playing in E, and I was like, okay, let me do an E whatever, a uh, riff or something. And so I, I played a little melody in E with whatever. And so that's what the, they picked up the pattern that was rhythmically more interesting, I guess. And, 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 they, and that turned into, which is essentially like a three chord progression, three quick chord progression or whatever. And, um, and but that became a motif, obviously. Yeah, I mean, it just, uh, it was very, there was much more information in the final form than, than that, but the motif was kept because Th those three notes were played consistently at intervals that you imagine it's more like a like a chorus coming back or something in a song, right? So this actually improvised uh, experiments can be a good um, like thought experiment that can maybe can answer a question: Who? Because when we think about of that collection of cells within us, hmm. it's like hard to think who is uh, the decision maker. But yeah. Uh, but when we form this kind of group, I think observing ourselves in the group, uh, making something uh, jointly, mm -hmm. can can somehow give us a glimpse on who is finally running the show. <laughs> and the answer is no one most of the time, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I didn't think, <laughs> maybe I didn't maybe that... we should make that experiment with this specific uh, yeah. uh, goal, you know, mm -hmm. to find who is running the show. Because I think I think the, I mean, Fodis was absolutely on point. I guess as a cybernetician in residence, is your duty to bring up the cybernetics of of of, of that this cybernetics uh, angle on this question because, I mean. I don't know. I, I think of an example of something like, if you if you think of a of a car or a ship or something, um, would you say that the engine is driving the car? Because, in some sense, energetically, the engine is where the most uh, power goes through, or something. Sure. I mean, one can simplify that way, but you know, if you remove, say, the wheels of a vehicle or or the steer or or, or the hull of a ship. The engine alone is obviously not a ship that is not going anywhere, right? So, so in that collectivity, there is also some codependency. Exactly. There's a specialization. There's a structure. So, so trying to trying to boil it down to who is in charge kind of formulation might be too reductive. In some situations, it might have a meaning that you want to find, and it, it might be meaningful to find it. But in general, generally. Um, it's certainly in the band that I, I improvised in, I improvised for like five minutes, not more, for 10 minutes. But in that context, I, I, it was clear that there was no leader. It was clear that the, 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 what was happening there was, a, was an emergent thing, but it was absolutely crucial that there was a groove 
that there was a bass player and a drum player that were keeping the groove. If that wasn't there, there will be the, the result will be completely different, right? So, which is kind of like there being an engine in a car or something. I mean, you can't have a car without direction, transmission, and wheels and whatnot. But obviously, if you remove the engine, then certainly you're not going anywhere, right? By so, the way, once I was uh, watching one a performance where only drummers, but different types of drums, like all, I think there were 12 drummers, uh, were performing together in improvised mode. And I can tell you, even with the drums, they managed to have the this uh, bass and the theme and the rhythm, yeah. and only with drums. That's 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 beautiful. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. All right. Um, oh, there's a question here from Bastian Kaiser. No, not sure if this is out of the scope, but can you say something about the connection between Levin's work and Carl Friston's active inference? Well, <laughs> we are. Um, <laughs> That's a very thematic. active what can you repeat? Act active inference. So active inference, um, just for <laughs> for a note on SEMP. So active inference is the central theme of one of our focus groups in our community. So I'm gonna show to the YouTube viewers our so this is uh, Alejo who was in the YouTube chat by the way. This is good publicity for everyone to follow their example. <laughs> they just joined on uh, on our on our YouTube on our Discord server from our YouTube chat. So you can see here in the focus groups, we have the free energy focus group. This free energy focus group is dedicated to uh, understanding active influence. So it's the sort of more mathematical, the more theoretical, uh, rigorous approach to active influence. So all I can say is I know there are absolutely conceptually very well-grounded connections, but I am still, because I'm part of this group, I'm still learning about it. Uh, I am a, I'm an ignorant uh, complexity scientist, and I'm still learning what entropy is. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I don't really know the details. I don't know if for this you have uh, some some closer insights on that. So no, it, it, it would be just bland. Let's this plain speculation. <laughs> There is there is definitely a connection. Um, especially when we're talking about selfhood and boundaries, I think this is where it probably becomes most important because of, because of the way you can define boundaries mathematically in active inference. As, yeah, and the, the, and the whole market, uh, mark of blanket kind of uh, vocabulary. But I don't know, like, this there's a con there's there's a connection to be made there I think. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think. Um, I mean, my understanding, of course, is that uh, so Levin's work is mostly experimental, or the, although they have been working on developing computational models and uh, sort of a theoretical foundation and so on. Um, Michael's work is mostly experimental, um, and or at least strongly based on experiments and their um, testing ground is always the wet lab in some sense, uh, or, or, or the silicon lab, but it's a lab. It's not a, it's not a simulation or a, or a model on, in a computer. Um, <clears throat> so my, I mean, my understanding of course, is that active inference is more of a theoretical framework. It's a, it's a modeling framework, right? It's, it, it provides a set of tools with mathematical prescriptions and, and formalism to, to, to model uh, systems. But I think the connection is that what the kind of phenomena that Michael is observing and the kind of phenomena that Michael is um, highlighting is precisely the kind of phenomena that active inference is probably very likely to be successful to model, right? At, at least in my, in my uh, early understanding of uh, active inference as a, as a formal framework. Because... Um, uh, I mean, it, it's meant to be a, as far as I understand, it's meant to be a sort of following up the steps of just thermodynamical descriptions and just uh, on descriptions of aggregates and things like that, where where you are in, where you are mathematically modeling aspects of uh, inference and probabilistic and uh, kind of determination and things like that. Again, I, I'm I'm speaking from ignorance. I, I don't really know the details, but 
the kind of thing that, that it is, mm -hmm. uh, the, the framework, uh, is that of a mathematical theory to mathematical and computational uh, framework to, uh, to model behavior in the world, right? It might be, in fact, a way to naturalize active inference because active inference mm -hmm. is like com very computationally, like in ontology is computational, it's based on inference. Uh, um, as, and but like the, the the natural analog of this inference is like it's, it's not clear. It is it is a, 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 an abstract container. So you could, you could talk like um, so. Uh, I'd be interested not in the just like trying to model like um, uh, the like outputs like that you see in a, an experiment, experiments with bioelectricity, not trying to like apply uh, the uh, active inference to uh, this theory of uh, uh, this framework of bioelectricity length and the engineering components of it, but the other way around. I think that would be very interesting for me because this is what is lacking from active inference, basically. It's like exactly like this naturalistic component hmm. to ground the inferences, basically. Which leads, like in in philosophy conventions, leads to all kinds of problems. It's just like a symbol grounding again. Mm. Yeah, that'll be interesting. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. If we have more comments here. I don't think so. Um. So this has been more or less about an hour of discussion. I think it's uh, acceptable on my end. Um, so unless uh, someone, I'm going to give a uh, courtesy of a minute to uh, the audience express some questions. I, I'm, I'm still curious about, uh, like, uh, Michael managed to cure cancer cells with application of external, like, uh, force, let's say. Uh, I don't know. But... Uh, hmm? I don't know. I, I, I don't think... No, don't you think say they yet. were with electrodes making... Yes, the interventions are like electrical. Yes, so, so, that's what I was yeah. meaning. But still, it's um, like if this uh, uh, this uh, disease was caused by the whole pro process happening in the body, there should be some mechanism that's, that's of reversing not, it. Probably that, your hypothesis is your your assumption that you just mentioned is not accurate to what Michael was saying. Because it's not that the, the, the disease was caused by, by the whole system in an indefinite way. The, we know precisely by the experiment that I was showing in the video that the, the, it seems, as far as all the evidence suggests, that the disease is caused by a local effect of the, of the, of the cells in that region that, that affect the bioelectricity patterns and the informational uh, behavior of that region. So it's not at no point there is a reference to the whole in, affecting sort of downwards causation kind of way that the whole affects the, the, the local. In this particular experiment, I'm not saying in general in biology, but in this particular case, it does not seem to be uh, that the behavior of, uh, of the microorganism is affecting the local bioelectricity in such a way that cancer develops. Because precisely um, the experiment shows the opposite. Right. I'm not sure if there were there is like a conventional research uh, exists on that, but like uh, ancient traditional practices, returning to like indigenous practices, shamanic practices, uh, they uh, state uh, and practically they have like throughout the history the results that uh, the mental state of a person mm -hmm. really influences even the cancer, like the the cause. Like I came to this understanding of. Uh, yes. cancer as informational disease and like electrical disease through like this path just understanding that our thoughts they form how our body uh, like shape because um, yes, but... there is a lot of evidence of like correlation of certain patterns of thinking with certain uh, contractions of in our body and of that's course. how the yes. locality happens like Certain thought thought produces the contraction in certain part of the body of the muscles, yes, and that blocks all the circulation, like okay. fluids and yes, yes. So 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 yes. So I mean, it's... and and that's what what my like the question is, like if this like happens, 
uh, if uh, the opposite can happen. So uh, why not to like go to make research maybe to Michael no, but, but uh, this, and, but... and think how how the 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 person itself can uh, himself or herself can deal with this without and and it's more I think more as also prevent uh, preventive um, medicine but there's no, uh, so, how so, not okay. to get into yes this. yes but the, the there is there is evidence not you don't have to go back to shamanic rituals or anything like that there is evidence that um, the the patient's psychology influences physiological diseases. We know this because the physiology is centralized. I mean, we, but one thing is to say that there is some uh, effects, and the other thing is to is to assign causation because in complex yeah. systems, causation is is a very contentious thing. And we know in 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 medicine, in general, in biology, we know some lines of causation that are very clear. So, for example, you know that you can be certain. That uh, that uh, you know, if you develop an infection in your lungs and an inflammation in your in your lungs, you can do a biopsy and you can find a cert certain bacterium or a virus, and you can be sure that there's a there's a causal connection between the disease and this agent that is causing the disease. There are some cases where this causality is closed, um, and in this particular situation with cancer, so far there is no indication that neuro neuro signaling patterns are going to have any direct effect on this phenomena that because cancer is not understood entirely as a mechanism and michael proposes that that at least one form of cancer or some kinds of cancer are of, are, are of a certain kind uh, that deal only with the informational dynamics of the bioelectricity of cells in a region of the body or in a tissue or whatever and so if that's so then it's a very clear answer to the question can you affect the development of cancer by thinking the answer is no because the the local uh, bioelectricity pattern is not causally connected directly to the the thinking patterns right that doesn't maybe mean... it's not the thinking but the feeling well that doesn't matter. Way, what is the difference no that doesn't matter <laughs> it, it, any 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 neural pattern that that has to do with with your with your behavior in a direct way, obviously indirectly everything is connected, but in a direct causal way, so you can assign causality, is the same as saying you put you, you gave the example of the muscles and con muscle contraction and, and neural patterns. We can assign a causality uh, relation there because we know that there are, there are actions, there are physically connected actions that go from the brain to the muscle. There's a single cable of, of a single cell that is going in that direction. So we, we can attribute that causality without without hesitation once we have the data. But something like a cancer development, that exactly this, this, this uh, if we didn't know, then there might be more room for hypothesis. But now with these kinds of experiments, what's showing you is that what causes the cells to go into cancerous or tumorous behavior is the local informational dynamic. So it is therefore causally disconnected from the context of the entire body, what the entire body is doing. Uh, it, it doesn't depend on that because it's by by evidence of these uh, experiments only connected to the fact that there's some particular behavior of the bioelectricity in the membranes of those cells. Because the thinking can uh, uh, produce the contraction of the muscles yes. in certain parts of the body. And when the muscles are contracted and they are like in the constantly contracted, for example, when you sit on like, like this and you're yes, like... Yes. You're, hand becomes frozen you don't feel anything yeah and that's basically what happening when your brain like uh, looping on certain like patterns uh destructive patterns it produces the same freezing in the body yes so but, but one one thing is to think of analogies but maybe more like m m more like small micro levels but that but that's the thing that the, the one thing is to think of the, the analogy that a part of your system is disconnected from from your brain, and that's why you don't feel it. And the other is to imply that there is a there is a causal connection between what a person is feeling or thinking or or somehow their psychological inner life with the behavior of bioelectricity of a tissue in their body. Because if there were a connection there, direct connection, it would be relatively easy to measure because we have fairly advanced ways of measuring neural behavior and we have fairly advanced ways of measuring t tissue. Maybe nobody yet had put it together, you know. <laughs> Maybe we should ask uh, Michael, can you please check it out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing is there's no, I mean, I'm not trying to push to push down your, your suggestion, but like 
what the Michael experiments kind of shows the opposite of the, that possibility, right? So Michael's experiment in a way is um, not negating that the local effect could have a causal relation to, to some mental dynamics. There's no, there's, that's a possibility still, but the mechanism itself that is, that is controlling for um, the, the behavior of the cancer cells seems to be, I mean, they can alter it with just some local uh, treatment. So imagine that, you're, that there, is a, there is no uh, particular nervous uh, terminals around the area where this is happening. The many parts of your body don't have any any nervous tissue because the nerves are just going through. There's no termination, so there's no direct input from your brain to those areas of the of the body. Nonetheless, that part of the body can develop cancer, and there, there's no there's no, so it is it is very... because maybe it's not only electricity because it's maybe more like complex um, uh, behavior. It is we know this, and but and Michael is reducing that complexity by showing that. Uh, when you intervene, the bioelectricity patterns of the membrane and the interconnectivity of uh, cell uh, walls with each other, which is a very specific thing. It's, you can think of many other aspects of whatever, the salinity, the concentration of this chemical or that. But he's saying, no, 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 look at the specific structure of the information flow in the cell walls between the neighbors, and that's going to determine whether they go cancerous or not. Nobody... Nobody had thought of that, and that's something that is clear from the evidence. And so if you can argue that there's a way by, by which the nervous system can directly affect that pattern, then it's plausible that the, the, that can happen. But in many situations, uh, the, the, body, the body's architecture does not allow for that because there are no terminals of, of the nervous system in many, I mean... But it's not only about neural system, it's about the whole tissue system in general. Because for yes. example, if, if, okay, the nerve comes here, let's say, and the main contraction is here, but the whole geometry of the body like sh shrinks. Yes, of course. And and it influences even the areas which are not connected through the uh, neurons, neural yes. Um, networks. Yes, but one example. So so that's why I say that it's like more complex rather than just. Uh, no, no, it is. It is more complex. Connection. That's exactly the problem here. But one counterexample for the possibility that you're suggesting, and I'm I'm, I'm just suggesting the. I'm just um, commenting on the possibility that there is a direct direct causation uh, of a psychological state and, and the development of cancer. You have bone cancer that develops inside the bones, and bones are they just never have any any connection to to the to the nervous system. It's almost the definition of the tissue of bone is the the tissue that is static. It's never going to react to uh, to nervous signals, right? So it is that the bone brain, yeah, that. Uh... How did liquid or or it's an, an, it it's more like hard tissue you speak about? Well, bone cancer. I mean, it, 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 in the in the bone tissue, you can have you can have you you develop you can develop this um, cancerous behavior. You, you can have tumors of that tissue, the bone tissue, right? So so bones are very isolated from the nervous system by 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 the physiology of of the tissue, right? So we know that even if some forms of cancer could possibly be influenced uh, directly by, by ner nervous activity, or, uh, albeit indirectly, we know that some forms of cancer do not have a causal relation with that because they, they emerge without this. And then if you take Michael's, Michael's uh, work as evidence, it is sort of um, reinforcing of that because you realize that what actually caused the cancerous behavior was just a, a pattern of uh, of uh, membranes, cell membrane informational dynamics. It didn't have to do with whether there was a particular chemical or there was an input signal from somewhere else or anything like that. So, so that's uh, that, that's why I think it, it might be more contentious. But anyway, um, would be nice to dig deeper into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's. Uh... It's fascinating. I, I think Michael is uh, Michael's work is going to be very famous soon because um, when they apply this, I mean, it might not pan out, but if, if if they, I mean, if they can apply what they showed in the stat poll in a patient, I mean, that that is very close to curing cancer in in, in a very explicit sense, um, and and so I imagine that that his work is going to be extremely. There is uh, one well -known. work. Oh, then I forgot the name of the researcher, and he is researching on 
like resonance. And he managed also to remove actually he resonated the cancer cells with certain frequencies oh, yeah. and the can but in this case the cancer cells were i think they were demolished yes they were destroyed they, they, by, by virus. yeah yeah they were not uh, like uh, Cured. converted back yes yes yes, yes. yes. it's no, it's is, a bit different approach this is typical because most of the uh, that's a therapy right that's a form of uh, cancer uh, treatment yeah exactly it's a form it's of treatment. Treatment. destructive uh... yeah. Like 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 radiotherapy or chemotherapy, even those are attempting to destroy the cancer cells, right? Yeah, um, but I think this is a returning back to the family is a yes, very yes. sweet approach. Yes, yes, yes. No, no, this is amazing. I mean, this is the holy grail. It's like, uh, come you, back, you know, like come yes, back. Yes, yes. No, absolutely. You it's, are it's, you are it's, ours. We yeah. love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's pretty much the the analogy. Yes, like saying. Come back to us. Don't don't go on your own. <laughs> it's uh, yes, it's very cool. Yeah, by the that's way, that's what I'm thinking. How we can? Uh, that's what I want to speak about with him in person. How we can manage a person self manages mm -hmm. this, you know, self curing. Yeah. Who knows, Alvaro? No, the, uh, Alona, you were asking before that uh, how exactly could uh, the all the Michael Levin research be applied to treat cancer patients, like human uh, cancer. So I remember that he, in, in some of his talks, uh, he talked about this uh, company, I guess, yeah. of his, uh, that on the website, uh, you can read that uh, they are talking about drugs that can modify electric potentials in cells and tissues. So... Is it acid? <laughs> I guess not, but who knows? It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, interventions. I mean, uh, the, the, no the, the, capsu the capsules that you take are just uh, little machines that go into the right. So, uh, <laughs> nanobots. Uh, all right, everyone, that was, that was a pretty um, fruitful conversation, I would say. Um, we don't we'll have any more comments here, so uh, it's getting late over here, so I will happily close it off. And, uh, well, I'll see you on Sunday. Alana and Fodis, if you can make it to the Ford Plus. Um, and then we can talk more about Amsterdam and plants and, and whatnot. Um, but to all the viewers, uh, thanks for uh, coming to another community live stream. I will post the link for you to join our community. We had a couple of people join today, actually. So follow their example and join us on Discord. Um, all you have to do is leave your email and tell us about your disciplinary interests, and then you can access the online community uh, and uh, eventually access these uh, conversations, these uh, online chats. Um, and so, yes, the next uh, bi-weekly theme is going to be about the information continuum because in a week and a half, we're going to be in Amsterdam uh, running this uh, in-person event. Uh, we will try to live stream it or to ha have some kind of presence on YouTube. So do look uh, forward to that. And other than that, it was great to see you all. Thanks for this. Thanks, Alana. Thanks, Albert. And see you all soon. Bye.